Hey guys, it's Heidi with AMP Home Church, and welcome back for our Seeing the Unseen study. Uh, Randy Alcorn, it's a 90 day devotional. We are on day 28. Uh, these videos come out Monday through Friday. If you're new and joining us, welcome and hello. These are all in a playlist, so you can go back and catch up on any that you might have missed so far. Um, love joining in and doing this, and then of course, invite you guys to come and join us on our Facebook group. Everything is linked down below, so you can check everything out there. Of course, subscribe and tap that little bell icon that will let you know each day when these come out um, but we're gonna go ahead and dive in it's really neat to see this topic that's coming out because obviously I am recording this before you're watching it but the topic is has a lot to do with busyness and rest and, and those types of uh, things that I know especially in our modern culture we're all very aware of um, interesting though to note because it is Passover. It is the time of Passover. And so taking in, I'm currently finishing preparing all of my work that needs to be done because at sundown tonight, I will start in for a complete day. Um, the Jewish calendar goes from sundown to sundown. So going in for a complete day of rest and holy assembly here with this time of Passover. So I thought this was rather interesting, again, to see the coincidence of all of these things falling perfectly in line. Of course, because I believe in no such thing as coincidence. I heard somebody say once that coincidence is just the times when God decides to stay anonymous. So the little things that just seem to happen, feel like they're coincidence? Nope, still got it work. So day 29, anyways, beside all of that, let's jump in. Delighting in him is the topic today. It says time with God is the fountain from which holiness, joy, and delight flow. It reminds us who we are and whose we are. Have you been sitting at the feet of Jesus as Mary of Bethany did? See Luke 10, 38 through 42. Have you been turning your back on a thousand distractions to enjoy the presence of your bridegroom, the carpenter from Nazareth, the one who said he was going to prepare a place for you and is coming back to get you so that you can be with him forever? See John 14, 2 through 3. Would you say, reflecting on yourself and your life, that yes, I've been doing these things, right? Time with God is the fountain from which holiness flows along with joy and delight. It reminds us who we are and whose we are. As Paul tells us in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. We are aliens and strangers on earth who are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. That's Hebrews 11 verses 13 and 16. If we delight ourselves in God, that will transform the desires of our hearts. We will want what he wants. We will want his closeness and the desire of our hearts will be to hear him say to us, well done. And when that day comes, he will flood us with more joy than we can imagine. He will say, enter into the joy of your master, right? We see that in Matthew 25 verses 21 and 23. A couple other scriptures that you might want to note down. Psalm 119 verse 174 says, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. John Piper once said, God's greatest interest is to glorify the wealth of his grace by making sinners happy in him. And C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. C.S. Lewis is fantastic and totally hits the nail on the head all the time. I see where Randy Alcorn definitely gets a lot of his um, kind of encouragement and inspiration from C.S. Lewis. So let's now turn to, and again, the timing of Passover, the time of the spring feast, the time of just the world stage today, and most everybody's at home a lot more than we were um, even a month ago. Go to epm.org forward slash busy. That's the blog post for today. And it says, can't you see that I'm busy? Kind of a long one, but I think really, really, really important to hit pause for a minute and listen to this, right? Pause on all of the distractions of life and pay attention. Those questions we just asked at the beginning of this. Can we say that that's where our focus, our heart, our priority, our time is? It's being at the feet of Jesus. And how do we do that? By seeking his his wisdom through his word, by spending time in prayer, by, by living these things out, right? Can't you see that I'm busy? There was work to be done. After all, when Jesus came, the twelve came with him. The house needed to be swept, food would have to be prepared, and the table set. 
26 extra feet would require washing. Bedding, too, must be arranged. Just traveling dinner guests always spend the night. If I don't do it, she may have thought it won't get done. I don't know if any of you watch um, on my YouTube channel, and we haven't done it in forever, but on the Heavenly Minded Homeschool YouTube channel, my friend Lex, um, the associate pastor Travis, his wife, we did, we we're doing them all the time, and it's been forever since we've done it, but Mary More Than Martha. And it's that story there of Mary and Martha in scripture, right, that he's talking about here, where she's so concerned, uh, Martha, so concerned about getting the house taken care of and all the things and food cooked and all of that. And Mary's just sitting in there at the feet of Jesus. And she goes in there and she's like, hello, can you like come do something? And, and Jesus puts Martha in her place, not Mary. And for us, that's where that idea came from is we should all be striving to be Mary more than Martha. Sure, we're Martha sometimes. There's food that has to be cooked. I'm doing that today. House has to be clean. Food has to be cooked. Stuff has to be put in order. But am I still doing these things? Am I keeping them in their proper priority and order? Or am I letting the busyness of the world overtake everything else, right? It's keeping things in, in check. So we'll continue on with what he has to say. Housework and meal preparation were things no one else seemed to notice unless they didn't get done. It's real funny how nobody seems to notice, right, all the things that mom gets done until you stop doing them and then people realize that they don't like a messy house. Perhaps no one could remember a time when Martha didn't get them done and she was determined this day would be no exception. Both Martha and Mary loved and served Jesus, yet one was a worker, the other a worshiper. One was a servant, the other a seeker. Together they paint contrasting pictures of the Christian life. In scripture's account of the dinner, Martha is mentioned first. That's Luke 10, verses 38 through 42, if you want to pull it up. She was probably the eldest, certainly the one in charge of the home. Some speculate her family was prominent and wealthy. If so, she probably had several servants. She was a doer, a goal-oriented achiever, a believer in the work ethic who took pride in her accomplishments and thrived on success. Today, Martha would make a good executive, a coach, committee chairman, or Christian worker. She is the super homemaker type, a compulsive cleaner and five-course meal server who wouldn't be caught dead with, a dust on the with dust on the refrigerator or frozen pizza in the oven. As is often the case with siblings, Mary was quite different. Calm and relaxed, she seems more thoughtful and less tense than her sister. Mary was a thinker, a listener, a contemplator. Today, we might describe her as laid back or mellow, while Martha tended to be uptight. Martha was a classic example of what some physicians call the type A personality, those aggressively involved in an endless struggle to achieve, to accomplish more in less time. They, seem, they see people as obstacles to their goals and have little tolerance for others' deficiencies. Unfortunately, we can pause here. I know, speaking for myself, I am a guilty type a -er pretty much down to a T of everything he just explained here. So interesting, this is what I'm reading today. Imagine that, huh? Mary, on the other hand, was a type B personality. Patient and low key, she was people oriented. It's likely she often got distracted from her work to engage in conversation, much to Martha's annoyance. Mary may have depended heavenly on an impatient Martha to do her jobs for her. Martha was the type who would hoe weeds. Mary was the type who would smell the flowers. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to every pearl that dropped from his mouth. It wasn't every day that one could hear the master, and she wasn't about to miss that opportunity. Meanwhile, Luke tells us Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. That's in chapter 10, verse 40. And a great deal did have to be done, all without a vacuum, a range, oven, microwave, or even running water. Could you guys imagine? I can't imagine. Martha is not criticized for working hard to be a good hostess, rather for being distracted by her serving. The word translated distracted means to be drawn about in different directions. We are not distracted to something, but distracted away from something. She was distracted from Jesus. Being distracted is not always bad. One can be distracted from television, worry, eating, or even sin in general. Mary was distracted too from the housework. But more important, she was compelled to her Lord. Put yourself in Martha's position. She had had it. Perhaps the bread had burned, the drinks had spilled, and the kitchen was a mess. No one else was bothered, but perfectionist Martha lived under the self-imposed pressure that made her endure such occasions rather than enjoy them. That 
my guilt level right now. I don't know if like you can see the neon sign flashing over my head, but like it's going off right now. She prided herself in serving dinner on time and it was already late. Meanwhile, every time she breezed past the front room, her eyes focused on her sister Mary, blissfully seated at the feet of Jesus. It's not that listening to Jesus was wrong, of course. Martha would do the same if time permitted, but it didn't, or so she told herself. To Martha, Mary's behavior was sheer laziness and the height of insensitivity. Unfortunately, her own insensitivity is not spending time with Jesus never dawned on her. Having put up with this situation for more than long enough, Martha marched into the front room to the amazement of her guests. The Greek words used in verse 40 imply suddenness or haste. Stepping right up to her honored guest, she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do work to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. In essence, Martha accused not only her sister, but also Christ of insensitivity and injustice. Here is the Messiah, the Savior, God incarnate, right? Let's really grasp the totality of what's happening here. Not the kind of person to whom one barks out orders. Could you imagine walking in and snapping at him and being like, hello, what are you doing? But Martha lost sight of whom she was dealing with. She allowed Jesus's lordship to be eclipsed by her own grievances. Guys, again, we do all of this holding a mirror before ourselves. Are we guilty of this? The answer's probably yes. She was a lot like Peter, energetic, strong-willed, and ready to give advice, even to her Lord. When she should have been quietly listening to him, she was loudly challenging him. Those same attributes that made Martha a capable, effective manager also got her in trouble. She was aggressive, assertive, and strong in conviction. She was also quick to criticize. She was intolerant of others' differences and prone to self-pity. Maybe Martha was jealous of Mary's close relationship with Jesus, yet she could have been just as close had she chosen to spend time with him. She should have calmly talked taken her concern to Mary. Instead, she disrupted the good fellowship of weary travelers and thoroughly embarrassed her well-meaning sister, not to mention herself. But in Jesus's response, we learn as much about him as we do about Martha. He knew her heart. She did love him and was sincerely doing her best to serve him. She just didn't realize she was serving her own pride. She attempted to minister to him when she desperately needed to be ministered by him. John 11, 5 states, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. With amazing wisdom and tenderness, Jesus here demonstrates that love by not rebuking Martha's insolence. Instead, the Lord gently puts the whole scene in perspective for her. Martha, Martha, he begins, as one often did in addressing one he deeply loved and longed to lead in a better way. We can imagine Jesus gently placing his hand on her shoulder as he continues, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Right? We see that Luke 10, verses 41 and 42. The word translated worry comes from the Greek words for pieces in mind. Literally, it means to come to pieces in the mind or have a mind divided. Jesus admits there is no end to the number of things we might worry about, right? Matthew 6, 34, we see that when he says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? Why worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow will take care of itself. You got enough to deal with today. We can worry about our jobs, our possessions, our children, our health, or like Martha, our responsibilities. Worry does not stem from these things, however, but from within. It's the product of a mind that lacks perspective. Such a mind needs to fill itself from the reservoir of God's word, not the innumerable concerns that constantly vie for our attention. Let's read that one more time. Worry, we're talking about, is the product of a mind that lacks perspective. If you are worried, you are concerned, it keeps growing and all of that, that is stemming from your mind lacking perspective. Such a mind, so if you're worrying, if you're doing these things, that means your mind is lacking perspective. That means you should probably do this next thing we're going to say here. Such a mind needs to fill itself from the reservoir of God's word, not the innumerable concerns that constantly vie for our attention. That's huge. 
Martha quite likely knew the verse, be still and know that I am God, right? Psalm 4610, most of us have it on like coffee mugs and t-shirts. Yet she seldom put it into practice. Mary chose what is better or literally the better portion. The reference is to food and it sets up an interesting contrast. While Martha devoted herself to preparing physical food, Mary devoted herself to receiving spiritual food. She was a hungry soul, single-mindedly devoted to the spiritual meal served by Jesus and oblivious to all else. Jesus stresses the issue of Mary's choice, yet Martha also had a choice, even though she probably thought her hands were tied. I have to do this work, she rationalized. It's not a matter of preference, but necessity, right? How many times have we done that? How many times do we use this as an excuse to neglect time with God? Charles Hummel's The Tyranny of the Urgent reminds us we must learn to discern between the urgent and the truly important. Serving the guests was much more urgent than listening to Jesus, but it was also far less important. Mary made her choice, and so did Martha. She was not the victim of circumstances. Remember that. We are all too quick to play victim. Stop putting ourselves in the center. And that removes the whole victim aspect real, real fast. Couldn't Martha have prepared a simpler meal or delayed dinner long enough to enjoy Jesus's presence? If she had, she could have gone about her duties with renewed perspective and probably with the help of her sister. Guys, I'm going to be for real and be for honest right here. Our bathroom renovation I've been working on for the past couple weeks has not been going very well. I was about in tears last night. It was a disaster. It's taking forever. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm done. My house is destroyed. My kids are on fire because I've been way too busy doing other things. Tonight is our Seder meal. Well, last night when you guys are watching this. And we're live streaming communion and all of these other things. I just after I still have to go to the store. I'm doing this. Still have to finish cleaning. Still have to go to the store and then start doing all of the things. I this afternoon said, you know what? This is ridiculous. All the things that I was going to make by scratch, by hand, all of the, from scratch, by hand, all of the stuff, we're doing some store-bought. I hate to do it. I am miss everything has to be homemade and all this. Some stuff is going to be store-bought. I'm still going to make our unleavened bread. That's super easy. We really look forward to it. But that was something that I feel was important. That's something that stands out to our family. It's something we must do. All of the other things that I make by scratch, nobody cares but me. It's just me because I'm neurotic and I think it has to be that way. Nobody else is putting that on me. So I had one of these moments today where I said, you know what? This is crazy. I'm exhausted. I'm stressing myself out. This is supposed to be a time of enjoyment and gathering and coming together in holy assembly and rest. It's not. If I'm over here trying to be Martha, I, I'm missing the whole point of it if I do that. So I had to stop, take my own thought process captive and say, you know what? No. I can go and buy it and it'll, it'll be okay. Everything will be fine. The Lord provided me the exact resources I need that I will be able to go out and do that. So I'm going to do that and it's going to be okay. And we're going to move on and we're going to focus on what's important because what's important is the Lord and the time here of remembrance and of gathering and communion, remembering the sacrifice of the Passover lamb as we look forward to the return of Christ, giving all glory to him and not worrying about how many items on the table I made by scratch. It doesn't matter. So that was kind of my today and all of this. My Heidi, get your life together. Where's your head? Because you're losing your mind. Like conversation that I had with myself. But I've also had plenty of times where I've never stopped myself and called myself out for it. We got to we gotta do these things when we're this type of person that's, that's doing this stuff, right? Jesus said of Mary, it will not be taken from her. Time spent at the feet of Jesus is an investment in eternity, a treasure stored in heaven. Is your perspective straight? In the perspective of eternity, what matters? The menu of food I was going to make from scratch by hand, taking all day to make it? Yeah, not an eternity investment. Time spent in scripture and study with my family serving other as we do this, way more important. Eternal minded. The Westminster Confession states, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Martha might have thought enjoy was a bit too frivolous. She suffered from job saturation. Today we too are often managed by our responsibilities. 
Sometimes when we are unsure of our direction, we attempt to compensate by doubling our speed. The result is a hurried and harried Christian life full of activity, but devoid of an eternal perspective. In his marvelous book, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty, Tim Hansel describes Martha-like believers as weary servants of the impossible. For us, there are never enough hours in the day or days in the week. Is that you? Often, the most committed to serving others give of themselves until they have nothing left, but they keep on giving, drawing from a dry reservoir. They have forgotten how to receive. Martha, too, forgot there was one thing even more fundamental than giving to Jesus. That sounds almost heretical, doesn't it? What could possibly be more important than giving to Jesus, rather, or receiving from him? The truth is, we need our Lord a great deal more than he needs us. Jesus wants our fellowship and devotion, not just our skills and efforts. He values our service less than our devotion and worship. Yet it is worship that fosters the most effective service. In his booklet, My Heart's Christ, My Heart, Christ's Home, Robert Munger, Munger, hopefully I'm saying it right, sorry Robert, envisions Jesus saying these words to the Christian who neglects personal time with God. Is this you? Do you do this, right? You hold up that mirror. The trouble with you is this. You have been thinking of the quiet time of the Bible study and prayer time as a factor in your own spiritual progress, but you have forgotten that this hour means something to me also, to Christ also. Do not neglect this hour, if only for my sake. Whatever else may be your desire, remember, I want your fellowship. That was the whole point of our 21-day Bible challenge at the beginning of this year, spending an hour, hour and a half every day just in reading God's word. Dedicated time that hits top priority on our list of reading scripture, of being in prayer, of of just spending time in God's creation and, and trying to find the right word, but just focusing on growing and nurturing our relationship with him. Where does that fall on your priority list? Martha is not rebuked for serving any more than Mary is commended for not serving. The message is not worship precludes service, but worship precedes service. I found when I was a pastor that grasping and maintaining this perspective on worship and service was the most important challenge in my ministry. It was also the most difficult. It's too easy to base my sense of worth on what I do or how much I do rather than who I am. Too often I cut short worship to devote more time to service. Ironically, whenever I put service before worship, I I shortchange those I'm attempting to serve and I shortchange myself. But worst of all, I shortchange my Lord. Do we ever stop and think of it that way? Every time we don't do this, you're shortchanging the Messiah. Christ who suffered and endured all for you when you don't deserve it, and he was completely blameless. And you're saying, yeah, sorry, back burner. Maybe next time. You don't understand. I got these other things. Do we really stop and, and think of it with that, that weight and that truth? Satan's favorite lie is there's work to do. God understands. He's always available, and there'll be plenty of time to spend with him later. Hence, the urgent displaces the important. We allow the labor of our hands to overshadow the love of our hearts. Often the urgent is what people want us to do, but the important is what God wants us to do. Jesus did not not always live up to others' expectations, but he was in touch with his father and knew how to separate the grain of God's will from the chaff of man's will. At the end of his life, Jesus said to his father, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do, right? John 17, 4. What strikes me is not that Jesus Jesus worked or even that he finished his work, but that the work he finished was what God gave him to do. Right? We think about it, he's 33 years old. I mean, there's no way you could have finished all the work you had to do. Could you imagine? I mean, imagine if we had Jesus on the earth for 50 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years. Like, look what he accomplished in just this little tiny short period. Imagine if we had so much more, but that was exactly what God needed him to do. So it was exactly, it was fine. No big deal. That's, it's, it's perfect. It's exactly as it needed to be. He was in touch with his father. Got to be in touch with God so that you know how to separate the grain of God's will from the chaff of man's will. So I want us all to really weigh this really, really Focus in on this and search scripture and be in prayer. Pray for conviction on this. Let's look at our lives today. Where are we 
taking in the world's busyness and what the world is saying is urgent and must be dealt with versus honing in on God's word and God's will and what he says is important for us. Okay. Think about that. Share in the comments. I'm really excited to talk about this with you guys today because again, obviously as I've shared, it's kind of a big, big one for me as well. So, um, I'm going to go, my button is falling apart everywhere. I am going to go finish um, doing my things. I think I'm going to put my earbud in because I got some scripture I need to listen to while I finish up doing my stuff I'm doing. And uh, see you all tomorrow. Bye, guys.